So thank you all for coming, and I hope that you're all tuned in and you're ready to deal with the world of uh, unique identifiers and Excel uh, challenges and the like coming out of Gary's talk. Um, we're going to hang out together for pretty much the next day, and we're going to try to work our th way through a lot of issues around gene regulation. I was listening to some of you describe your, your, your own lists and your own projects, and, and there's some things that I'm, I'm not doing uh, in this that I may try to add a little bit in later this afternoon, because I particularly heard there were some people with exome lists and other or, or challenges, uh, and we're facing those same types of issues. And so I'll introduce you to a couple of tools that we have for, for trying to find our way to, to interesting sets of genes within exome analysis. So I'll sneak that in in the afternoon as an extra, extra piece. Um, what we're going to try to do today is, today and tomorrow, is we're going to sort of alternate between me talking at you and then you trying to do some stuff, and then me talking at you some more, and then doing some stuff. So we'll flip back and forth over the, the course of the time. Um, the timing, I'm sure, won't be precise to the, the schedule. So if I finish a little early, then we'll jump into the lab work a little early. If, we, if you're clearly saturated with the laboratory work, then we'll jump back into the, the speaking as we need to in the, in the flow. Um, but I think it's reasonably close to on schedule. And I have, I'm multi-armed with multiple laser pointers, so we should be, uh, should be good. Um, okay, so I'm a researcher who's particularly interested in gene regulation and transcription factors. Um, and I think that in this context of this class, in this workshop, my goal for you is not that you're going to be the master of all things on regulatory sequence analysis, but that you'll have a pretty good understanding of the types of information that are out there, how you can go and get some of that information, how you can do a little bit of manipulation of that information. Uh, some of those things are general purpose tools, and so you'll have some things that are going to be useful to you no matter what you're doing, and some of them are a little more specialized. Uh, as you move into the pathway components of the class, you're going to see some of the same themes coming up again, and so you'll see some, some utility of, the, uh, of the, uh, the general purpose methodology. Okay. Uh, I'll also note that the slide pack you have has a few uh, typos and a few uh, things that I've swapped out in the presentation, and I'll continue to refine the presentation as I go along so that uh, um, there may be a few other additional changes from your, your paper deck. Um, there's really only one added slide so far, so the numbering on your slide shouldn't be too bad, but you'll see a few, few, few small changes. Uh, it's all on the wiki, by the way, so if you're following on your screen, uh, it's on the wiki for you to grab. Okay. So the course of this, uh, this flow, we're going to do an overview of transcription. That's going to be ultra fast. So you're not going to get the uh, biochemistry 405 uh, version. You're going to get the biology 291. Um, you're going to get uh, some information about the prediction of transcription factor binding sites uh, because it's core to everything else that comes along. So you'll need to have that understanding as a basis for some of the things that happen thereafter. Um, then we're going to explore the uh, detection of novel motifs which is pattern discovery. So given a bunch of sequences and you don't really know what the pattern is that's in them, can you recover the transcription factor binding sites that are in there? Um, and that, by the time you get to that, you should have a pretty good idea of where a lot of the foundational components are coming from that you're using in, the in regulatory sequence analysis. Um, the next phase after that is we're going to go into interrogation of sets of co-expressed genes. So you've got your gene list and you want to f identify whether there might be a transcription factor or multiple transcription factors that are acting on those genes. Um, and so we'll talk about how the methods are, that are used for doing that. In each of these, um, particularly in this case, in this case we'll do lab sections where we'll go through and try some of the tools that, that use these methods so that you can get your hands on them. Uh, if you're, you're superstars, then you can plow through the, the one that I give you there. And I've got a few other tools on the, on the list for you to go and try as well. Um, the integrated assignment tonight will, will unite, unite some of the parts from these as well, so you'll have a chance to take the, the canned version this morning uh, and work your way through the, the one with a lot of support, and then tonight you'll have a chance to do it on your own for another set. And if you have your own gene lists, of course, you're welcome to try, uh, come and try some of the things on those. And then tomorrow we're going to dive into regulatory networks, which essentially means how do we look at combinations of factors acting together instead of one factor at a time, which is going to be the focus of the, of the day. Is that good? Okay. Uh, I'm a big believer of hands up and questions, and so please uh, ask if there are things that you think about, you've heard about, that you uh, don't understand how it relates to something else, please ask, um, because this is the great benefit of having it in this, this style of format. Uh, and you'll be much happier if you're talking. Okay, so let's talk about transcription. I'm going to be focused pretty much on human 
and mouse in the flow of this. The good thing is the transcription pretty much is universal, and the, the methods here are largely universal. Uh, some of the ChIP-seq things get a little bit different when you're working in bacteria, uh, but by and large, uh, the bulk of this is, is true throughout um, multicellular organisms. Okay, so this is the view of transcription fa factors as much of bioinformatics is based on. There's a protein, it binds to DNA, it casts out this magical mystery signal, and it brings a polymerase machinery to the, to the transcription start site, uh, and we can now proceed down making RNA. Um, we all know that that's, not sim that that's too simplistic, that we have a much more complex and rich world of, of gene stru chromatin structure and gene regulation control mechanisms. Um, but by and large, the first box that I'm going to talk about today is going to be focused on this, this concept uh, from just this idea of a protein sticking to the DNA. But let's put ourselves in some, some frame of mind about this. Um, here's some terminology. Um, termino everybody uses this slightly differently, and so there's no, uh, no perfection in what I'm telling you here, but I'm going to tell you how I use some of the terminology so that when you hear me saying things, you'll know where it's coming from. Um, and I'm also going to tell you, try to educate you a little bit about transcription. And I feel like I'm blocking your view over here. So uh, you're good. Okay. Um, so here's our here's our DNA. Uh, here's a gene that's uh, <coughs> situated along the, the wall here. Um, the gene is a multi-exon gene. There's more exons cascading down the wall. Um, at the start of the gene is what we'll call the transcription start region. Some people refer to that as a transcription start site. Uh, you'll see it oftentimes in the literature defined as a transcription start site with a specific coordinate. And one of the things we've learned over the last few years in terms of regulatory sequences is that it's almost never a single transcription start position. But it's a region where there's transcripts initiating. And there's a small subset of genes which have a, a particularly well-defined transcription start site. But in almost all cases, it's a messy smudge of transcription start positions uh, that are there together. Uh, from nomenclature purposes, it makes a bit of a disaster because a lot of the things that we see in the literature are taught to describe uh, things rel relative to some start position, usually not defined which start position they're looking at. They'll give you some magic number about minus 79 or plus 265, but you don't know what plus 1 was. Uh, depending which transcript you look at, you'll see different things. So, so if you're going to refer to a transcription start in a paper, please refer to a specific coordinate on a specific assembly uh, so that we all know what you're talking about. Um, but I refer to it usually as a transcription start region. Occasionally, I'll decay and use a transcription start site. Um, the transcription start region uh, has around it what we'll call a core promoter sequence. And the core promoter sequence is the region that's roughly from about minus 100 to plus 100. And it's really the sequences that's involved in positioning the polymerase complex to allow the transcription to initiate. In some genes, there's a TATA box. It's about 30 percent of transcription start region. It's about 30 percent have a, a well-defined TATA box. The rest of them don't really have a well-defined TATA box. Some have a downstream proximal element, which I'm not showing here, which would be the sort of plus side of about plus 30 relative to the transcription start. Um, and so these core promoter sequences are, are what people classically talk about promoter regions. Um, a lot of literature will refer to promoters and think about them much more broadly, and they'll say something like the promoter region, and they might mean something like a few thousand base pairs on either side of the transcription start region. Um, I tend to refer to those as proximal regulatory regions because there's relatively little to distinguish a proximal regulatory region from what a distal regulatory region, meaning it's far away. And so this, there's a fuzzy line between proximal and distal, uh, and it just is sort of from a, a frame of mind of what you think is proximal and what you think is distal. Usually, proximal means it's sort of right up against the, the, the core promoter region. Uh, the proximal regulatory regions and the distal regulatory regions have can transcription factor binding sites within them that are involved in turning on the, uh, promoting the uh, transcription of the gene. These distal regulatory regions can be located very far away. So when we look at uh, analysis tools, oftentimes we focus on sequences that are relatively close to a gene. Uh, the distal regulatory regions can be upstream, they can be in the introns, they can be in the non-coding exons, there's even a few cases where they overlap into the coding sequences, so that's pretty rare. They can be downstream, they can be uh, hundreds of thousands of base pairs, millions of base pairs away from the gene because in the three-dimensional structure of the nucleus, those things are not necessarily very far away uh, in, in real space. 
there are even a few cases in the literature where people are suggesting that there are regulatory sequences on other chromosomes that are acting on genes, because in three dimensions you can, in theory, have another chromosome close by to a promoter and acting as a cis regulatory sequence in a kind of a weird definition of cis. So determining what is a regulatory region is hard. Determining what gene a regulatory region that is acting upon is even harder because they can skip over genes, again, because of the three-dimensional folding that goes on in the nucleus. Um, so from this slide, you should have uh, a few terms, core promoter regions, uh, regulatory regions, distal and proximal, uh, transcription factor binding sites, or TFBS, um, orientation. So in general, the, uh, the core promoter region is thought to be more of an oriented se sequence, so that it has its primary effect is, is in, in a certain direction. There are all sorts of promoter regions that are bidirectional, and in fact, there's plenty of evidence now to say that when you get a polymerase complex being recruited to a region, a subset of the time it's going to be recruited and you're going to spin a transcript off in the wrong direction. So you get a lot of transcripts going all sorts of the places when you get deep into RNA-seq data, because you'll see that the, the polymerase isn't that perfect a machine, and it will be producing things. And whether it's biologically relevant or not is unclear. So there's a lot of discussion in the literature around what that means that you're producing transcripts willy-nilly. Um, so the pr promoter region is generally thought to have sort of a directionality to it. Uh, the regulatory, the more distal and pro somewhat proximal regulatory regions, most of the evidence suggests they can be turned around uh, and that they're fairly orientation independent. Um, but that's said with some caveats. So, so there is some... Uh, orientation characteristics to many of them. Uh, but by and large, they should function uh, in either direction. Okay, so that's sort of the simplistic view. DNA is a naked piece that you're looking at on, the, on a line on a page. Um, but as we all know, uh, this regulation occurs within a complex three-dimensional structure of chromatin, and that there are many layers of regulation going on top of the transcription factors that are acting on the DNA. So when we talk about the the... Uh, core promoter region and this sort of a new situ setup of the polymerase complex. Um, we know that these transcription factors are acting uh, through multiple mechanisms. They act through, through co-activator complexes, uh, particularly through histone-modifying systems that allow it to open up and make the region more accessible or maintain the region as more accessible. Um, there are additional factors like the mediator complex, which are involved in bridging the interactions to the polymerase complex. And then within the, the, the system, uh, we can start thinking very, in a very detailed fashion about the chromatin structure. And so how the DNA is wrapped around the histones and the, the, the modifications that can be made onto the histones that will promote their packing or unpacking to allow the regulatory system to come into play. And so when you go in and you look at the, the data that you have available to you, you find that there's a rich source of data sources of data that have been generated over the last few years. And that project, those projects, particularly the ENCODE project, but a couple others that are relevant, uh, are, have done a very nice job of revealing regulatory regions, um, particularly in, in a few very well-studied cells types. Uh, and outside those few very well-studied cell types, it's a little less clear because the, the, each of these is context-dependent. So it depends on the type of cell, the developmental state, the physiological conditions, and the like. So what types of laboratory data are available? Um, this isn't a complete list, and you'll think of other ones uh, as you go along. I've added a few to the page on the screen as compared to what you have on your, your notes. Um, so defining where the, the promoter regions are located is largely been resolved by a combination of two related methods. So RNA-seq has done a brilliant job of identifying where transcripts are being produced. And um, CAGE data in particular has uh, revealed uh, most human and mouse uh, promoter regions at this point. And so you might ask, what's CAGE data? CAGE is a technology that's oriented towards capped RNA, so it's mature RNA products. And it's been developed largely by the Riken Institute uh, in Japan, where they do run a project, a series of projects called the Phantom Projects. And the um, online, you'll find in the UCSC Genome Browser that you can access some of the older uh, Phantom data sets, which map out these poor promoter regions. Um, there is a new phantom project that will be published later this year, um, and in that project they use a much higher throughput methodology for doing their cage analysis, and they profile over a thousand cell lines uh, and cells and tissues 
uh, to get a breadth of regulatory promoter regions uh, across human and mouse systems. And so all of a sudden we're going to go from a, a decent, pretty good understanding of where promoters are to now what I would view as an almost complete understanding of where promoters are. Uh, because we're going to have all of that information. It's also quantitative, so it's giving you expression data about where each of the promoters is active across those cell types. And so that data will be published probably in September or October, uh, and it will be pretty transforming in terms of how we think about uh, transcription starts. Um, we also use uh, epigenetic marks, so the, these histone modifications that are made on covalent modifications onto the, um, onto the histones um, in a variety of positions. And um, there's been a fair bit done with looking at ChIP-seq on the polymerase complex itself. By and large, um, the cage data, I think, is going to be used as the, the principal method and the principal data set for, for defining where the, the promoters are going forward. Okay, so then how do you define the regulatory regions? So either distal or proximal, where are these uh, sort of active open regions where the DNA is being bound? Um, there have been a few, uh, few sets of data generated over time, and they are all um, providing useful information at this point. So uh, coactivator ChIP-seq has been used a few times. And this is where you look at those coactivator proteins and you do ChIP-seq experiments on them, like on P300. And there have been a relatively small number of papers, but what's been shown is that they're exquisite for locating where these regulatory enhancers are and how active they are. And so where you have coactivator chip seq data, it will do a pretty good job of defining where the active regulatory sequences are in the system. Uh, the problem is that there are um, about 11 coactivators in the human system, and they're only running decent chip on about two of them. So about nine of them, uh, the antibodies are not quite good enough, and they're not quite getting clean data. So those nine are, are still somewhat invisible. Uh, the epigenetic marks, so looking at histone 3 uh, lysine marks at the fourth position and the um, 27th position and the other positions, uh, and I'm not going to give you an epigenetics lecture on every tip different mark that's possible, um, has also shown to be of high correlation uh, with regulatory regions. This has been a, a primary product of the ENCODE project, which I'll talk about in a minute, just to give you a, a sense of, of where some of the data is coming from. Uh, recently, um, it's been around for a while now, but there's been a few new, new generations of data sets on DNase-1 hypersensitivity. So DNase-1 hypersensitivity is an old biological assay looking to show that if you mix DNase with the uh, chromatins, where can it get access to and nick the DNA? And what uh, a few groups have been doing, particularly John Stam's group at the University of Washington, uh, has shown that you can do exquisitely deep uh, sequencing on a DNase-1 hypersensitivity uh, assay and not only identify those open and accessible regions, but you can actually now with those methods footprint where the transcription factors are sitting. So you can actually read off where the individual proteins are <coughs> protecting when you go deep enough in the DNase-1 hypersensitivity systems. Um, and interestingly, and sort of a, a parallel product of the Phantom Project and a few others, is that it is now being shown that you actually get small amounts of RNA being generated out of these uh, active enhancer sequences. So these are not genes, but that you're seeing the, the enhancers that are located. And in the Phantom Project, what they saw when they did their extraordinarily deep sequencing, which they didn't do on all their samples, but on a smaller subset, um, was that you get a small amount of RNA being generated going about equal, evenly divided on either side of enhancer sequences. And so that is now revealing um, tens of thousands of enhancer sequences uh, quite reliably and exquisitely. Um, the challenge, uh, the benefit of that is that it, because it's generated on RNA-seq data is you actually know which expression context those enhancers are active in. So where you see the data, you know that that enhancer was available and, and uh, done. It is, however, um, cost prohibitive to some extent because you're looking to go about 10 times deeper than you do for normal RNA-seq. So as the technology moves along, you can, can get there. Okay, so these are our experimental methods for defining where promoters and regulatory regions uh, are, are situated. Um, my own passion is on transcription factors, so I really care about these individual proteins that stick to DNA. There's about 1,500 of them in the human genome. Um, we only have deep data for about 120 or so of them. We have some data on about 250, 300 of them, uh, and about 1,000 of them. We really just don't know very much about them. We can have some sense of their binding specificities, and that's about it. Um, most of the data that we get on transcription factor binding sites is now generated out of ChIP-seq, so uh, individual. I just wanted to add one more thing to the regulatory regions. Mm -hmm. 
fair that formaldehyde assisted isolation of regulatory elements, basically a, like another way to get it open chromatin yep. as, as, a, as another way of finding putative regulatory reasons. Yeah, and so that's where it developed a principally out of Jason Leaves group in North Carolina. Uh, which has been a, a very nice way of identifying things. And in my, my experience in looking at it, there's a very, very high correlation between it and the DNA hypersensitivity data. Um, so I think they're both going to sort of the same general concept of, of open regions, but the FAIR sets have been very, very high quality data sets for a while. So thank you for pointing that out. Other, other ones that I missed that you love? Okay. Um, so to the transcription factors, um, there have been, uh, most of the data that we now have is from ChIP-seq data on transcription factor binding. So when you look at all the detailed laboratory analyses that have been done over the years, uh, they've revealed something on the order of a few thousand regulatory sequences where they go through and test them classically with putting them in front of promoters and in reporter systems, uh, making mut mutations on them, doing gel shifts to test the binding of them, uh, these sort of detailed uh, time-consuming products. So there have been a few thousands of regulatory regions defined by the old classical methods, and then any given ChIP-seq experiment will generate about five times more than all have been done uh, in uh, individual studies over time. So ChIP-seq is, is the way to go. Um, it is limited to those cases where you have a decent antibody for the transcription factor that you're interested in. And so that antibody limitation is quite uh, restricting on that because not every antibody works for chromatin IP. Uh, and not every transcription factor has been given enough attention to develop a good antibody. Okay. So this is an extra slide that I tucked in here because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about ChIP-seq. Um, so this is mostly to get some terminology that's going to come up in the, the lab that we're going to do in a little while. Um, so. Uh, this is a picture of the UCSC genome browser. It's a, a track taken uh, with a few different experiments. Um, in the tracks that are here, um, we're seeing some uh, histone modification marks. This is an H3K4 um, monomethylation mark in this column. And while normally it would be a layered one with multiple cell types in this particular track, I've restricted it so that we're only looking at cells from, from one particular cell line. And what you see um, plotted along the, the genome are an indication of the reads coming off the, the stri signal strength coming off the ChIP-seq data. Um, and there's essentially a, a, a depth of data uh, compiled in the high throughput sequencing of the chromatin IP reaction. I should add track. Does everybody know about chromatin IP and what those reactions are? Would anybody like a description of it? Okay. So let me, uh, let me do a quick description of chromatin IP. Uh, I, I can draw it for you later, but I'll do it just verbally for a quick second. So for in a chromatin immunoprecipitation reaction, what you do is you take a cell or sample that you're interested in. Um, you're going to try to see what proteins are sticking to a what piece of DNA. And so what you initially do is you cross-link in some way the protein-DNA mixture together. So you get a covalent attachment between the proteins that are there and the DNA. Okay. Then you're going to... Um, uh, shear the DNA in some manner, and so there's a few different methods for doing that, but basically you're going to try to cut the DNA up into smaller pieces. And so now what you end up with is a, a smaller piece of DNA, and in some places a covalent modification with the DNA attached to a protein. You then take an antibody that recognizes that protein specifically, and so you that, that antibody stick to that protein that's stuck to the DNA. You wash away all the other stuff that the antibody didn't stick to. And so now you have a complex which is your antibody attached to your protein attached to your DNA. Then what you do is you reverse the crosslink. So you break the covalent linkages. You then recover the DNA that's there. And you essentially take that into a high throughput sequencing machine and you see what piece of DNA came down. Now when you do that from a, a bulk sample, so it's not a single cell, but there's some efforts to get to single cell, but it's, it's a bulk mixture of cells. You then take all that DNA sequence data that you compiled and you re read it, map it onto the genome, uh, which I'm not going to get into for, for how to map uh, onto the genome right now. Happy to talk about that to anyone who wants to later on. Um, and then you essentially look to see what's the weight of evidence of how many reads do you have uh, c coming down to any given point. Um, the scoring and, and evaluation of that can take into account a few different um, 
uh, ways to correct for background. Uh, and so in a ChIP-seq experiment, there is an extreme bias. So ChIP-seq experiments, uh, any ChIP-seq experiment, with no antibody involved at all, just recovering DNA that shears, is going to give you regions that are prone to be at promoter regions. So you're going to get open chromatin very much in a biased manner out of a ChIP-seq experiment. So in the early days of ChIP-seq experiments, you'd see these wonderful papers. Everyone would say, my ChIP-seq experiment worked because I have most of my reads are around my transcription start sites. But what they didn't tell you was that if they did the same experiment with no antibody, they would get the same result. Okay, so now you've, uh, but you, what you then do is you try to make some correction for background. So much of informatics is always this idea of a foreground versus a background, and you're going to hear that over and over and over again over the next three days. So you take your foreground and you say, how much am I seeing of the reads in my foreground? And you compare that to some background and you say, how much am I seeing in my background? And you say, am I shocked by what I'm seeing or does it look pretty much like the background? Um, there have been now some ways to computationally simulate the background, take in other data sets that give some better measure of it. And so depending on the peak calling tool that you use, which is a software for doing this test, uh, some will use a, an experimental background, some will use a more computationally derived background. Um, in either case, you ultimately emerge with at each position in the genome, you give some indication of how strong is the signal uh, in your foreground against your background. And that's essentially what you're looking at uh, in these plots when you go to the genome browser or any other tool that lets you look at chip seek data. And so what you're seeing is a measure of how strong is the signal versus the background. And what you'll see over in and when you're looking at ChIP-seq data for transcription factors, this is a, a particular histone modification, which is similar. What you'll see is that there's a lot of low-level noise, so that across the genome you see a lot of stuff just coming through, and that's because this immune, chromatin immune precipitation experiment is kind of messy. Uh, you're going to get a lot of weird stuff uh, coming down, and so you have a base level of noise. Um, and then uh, in some places, you're going to see a lot of stuff going on. So you're going to see a lot more reads coming than you would have expected by your background chance. Um, so we've talked about reads, which are these individual sequences that came out of your reaction. Um, what you'll see then is that there are these blobs here where there's uh, stronger evidence um, of something happening, and those will be called peaks. So the peak, and generally in the terminology, the peak is the whole region that's in that, in that blob. So there's a a peak here, and it has sort of a, a start and an end to the peak. So you have, you apply your peak calling software, depending on the software that you use, you'll get slightly different variants of it, but you'll get uh, a start and an end position. Now, within that peak, you can see that not all positions are created equal, and that there's a, that um, somewhere within that peak, there's going to be a maximum position. And so that's called the peak max. And that's actually a fairly useful uh, piece of information to have, uh, as I'll show you a little bit later on. Um, now, within that um, region, so we've now uh, got a start, an end, and a peak max. The peak max need not be in the middle of it. So in fact, it's almost never in the middle of it, somewhere off from the middle uh, of, the, of the peak. Um, a lot of the software will assume that when you give it peak coordinates, that it's going to treat the middle of it as the peak max. Uh, and so you need to know when you're using software to analyze this type of data, what's it, what's it using and what's it doing. Because you may need to give it a peak max separately. You may need to manipulate your, your coordinates to use the peak max as the center. Uh, there's a, some issues that come into play of how you use that peak max position. There are um, an enormous number of peak colors. So bioinformaticians flock like uh, insects to, to data. And so what they'll do is they'll see a, a, a new type of data come, and then 100 groups around the world will flock to that data set, data type, and they'll develop their own unique tool and their own unique method for doing it. And so these things proliferate like crazy, and then the community decides which ones of them are, are particularly satisfying, and then they die off, and you're left with a few. What's the question here? So I have a question. So they assign a score, basically. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if that's It's not always clear, so you have to read the documentation. Usually, when you see a score, not always. Well, usually, to, um, max, so yeah. Okay. Usually, the score that you see will be associated with the peak max score. Okay. Sometimes you'll see something that's more of a, an overall average of the peak. So it is inconsistent how they they handle it. Um, <coughs> some software, depending on the software you use, uh, they'll have different attributes, and so some things that you might call at two peaks in your your view. 
might be joined together because they're not far enough apart in space, and so it might just join a bunch of things together that are, are nearby. Uh, so you, just because you have a start and an end doesn't mean that you have a nice, uh, nice Gaussian type shape. You might very well have something that looks more, more uh, uh, multi multi peaked. Okay. So does that give you a sense of what ChIP-seq is and what theta looks like? Okay. So there's this type of data is available uh, plentifully online, um, and it's big, as uh, Gary was mentioning earlier. So these are enormous data sets, and they're not always uh, easy to manipulate. Um, they're terribly uh, inconvenient for um, classroom-based instruction, as you're going to find out in the next little while, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, there's a few places to go uh, online to get, gather uh, large amounts of the data. Um, the UCSC Genome Browser is a particularly convenient format, so they keep uh, large amounts of this data available as downloadable tables that you can pull out. Um, the ENCODE project, which is a specialized repository within the UCSC system, uh, has uh, the bulk of the data that's been generated and released to the public up till now. And so this is um, focused uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation-based profiling, by and large, looking at epigenetics, looking at about 100 transcription factors, uh, looking across uh, up to 50 cell types, I believe, in the, the, the biggest case. So you can go there and you can pull down uh, large amounts of data. There's also, uh, not shown with the link here, there's also the Mod Encode project. So for those of you who work with model organisms, there's a few of the model organisms that have been profiled in a similar manner. Uh, all sorts of papers will also have their own repositories where they'll have some sort of specialized set online that they can go to and pull out information on their on their system. Um, the uh, the Gene Expression Omnibus, or GEO, uh, which many of you may know about, has expression data, but it also has chromatin immunoprecipitation data. So you can go and grab a lot of the data straight out of the, the GEO, uh, which has uh, probably more of the uh, independently published data as opposed to the, the large bulk data that's been, been produced. Um, for transcription factor ChIP-seq data, um, and a few others, but primarily for transcription factor ChIP-seq data, you can go to these places. There's also a couple of data sets. So Pizarre is a project that's run out of my lab where we try to compile a chip, transcription factor chip data into a, a common place. Um, and there's a group at Johns Hopkins that runs one called HM chip, uh, which you can pull out some of the chip seek data from. Um, if you're interested in other model organisms during the course of the afternoon, uh, we can go online and we can take a look to see where the best repositories are for you, and we can track down most of them. Okay, so that was a brief overview of transcription uh, and some of the key types of data. Now we're going to go into some informatics world pieces where we're going to talk about how do we use uh, some of this data and we're going to focus on transcription factor binding sites. Um, some of the methodology also relates to microRNA type target analysis, so you're going to see a generality, generality to that. Okay, so our job is to teach a computer to find a transcription factor binding site. This is work that dates back into the 1980s, so this is not a, a new domain. Um, I'm going to walk you through sort of the core ones that are still the popular methods that are in use today, and then I'm going to tell you that it's all washing away and that over the next five years we're not going to see these types of things so much anymore, and I'll tell you why. Uh, but for the next five years, it's probably going to be the dominant one that you're going to encounter. Okay, so, so old days style. Uh, some poor graduate students slogged through a gene. They, they mapped out a regulatory sequence by taking pieces of the gene and testing to see if they would drive expression in the, the context that was interesting. They eventually come down through mutagenesis and deletion analysis and map out a single uh, transcription factor binding site that their a protein sticks to and they might even know what the protein is. Um, and then they get uh, their PhD and, and graduated in 1979. So, so too late. <laughs> That's what you had to do for a PhD about 1980. Um, in the early 80s, you could do it by getting a bunch of binding sites. So you could do either through uh, uh, testing large numbers of things or using some higher throughput assay, which was largely a cell X assay, where you would mix a pool of a random pool of DNA with a protein that you're interested in and see what sticks to the, the DNA that the, to the protein you're studying, wash away the stuff that doesn't stick, repeat it a few times, and get a purified set. So in that way, you could get a bunch of binding sites. And then computationally, you could align all these binding sites together. 
and it wasn't always done computationally. Sometimes the poor graduate students would sit there by hand and manipulate the, the alignments to do it. Um, and ultimately, you get some sort of alignment of, of binding sites. And then what you can do is you can count how many times you see uh, every nucleotide at every position. Uh, you may occasionally see a consensus sequence. This is an IUPAC degeneracy code-based DNA consensus sequence. Um, most of those, that's pretty much washed away and people don't use consensus sequences anymore because they don't quantitatively reflect the data. So it can be better than that. Um, and so most of the time what you'll do is just count every nucleotide at every position and you'll record that in a matrix. And so that matrix is called a position frequency matrix or a PFM. Uh, and it corresponds to the positions of this alignment. So in the first position, first column of the alignment, you're going to see 14 A's, 3 C's, 4 G's, and 0 T's. OK, so that matrix is the bread and butter of, of transcription factor analysis. And it's what you're going to be using in some form uh, for the rest of the day uh, to work with on some of your analysis. Uh, you'll be generating them. You'll be applying them. You'll be using them to, to in, in bulk to study sets of genes. Um, looking at them is terrible, and so you have better ways to, to look at them uh, but using sequence logos. And the sequence logo is essentially a measure of the information content, so how strong is the pattern at each column of this, this matrix. And so in DNA, which has uh, four possible outcomes, you have two bits of information. So each yes-no question is a bit of information. So is it a purine? Yes or no. If it's a yes, then you can say, is it an A? And so by asking two yes or no questions, you can define which base is at a, a position. So in an information content logo plot uh, for DNA, uh, you'll see the maximum position that's possible is two bits. Uh, and you'll see that some positions are well informed. Uh, some positions are relatively not well informed. Uh, what does this reflect? By and large, what this reflects is where you have direct physical contacts between the transcription factor and the DNA. So where you're getting a connection, a physical connection between an amino acid touching onto a base, you're going to see a very strong information content. Where the protein comes away from the DNA and doesn't have a direct interaction with the base, it doesn't really matter what base you put there. And so you can imagine that the, the nature of the protein sticking to it, there's going to be contact points that are, are high information positions, and there's going to be remove points that are not important and, and there's variable. variable. Now, there's all sorts of uh, uh, caveats about uh, uh, the use of matrix models of transcription factor binding. Uh, they are very good for systems that are, are follow the consensus of which about 95% of all transcription factors behave nicely. Uh, about 5% of transcription factors do not behave nicely, and I'll tell you about those in a couple moments. Okay, computationally in the system, um, the tool does not use, ignore the brackets here, um, Computationally, this, in the system, we don't use the frequency matrix as the computing tool. We use what's called a, a position-specific scoring matrix or a position weight matrix. And what that is, is it's a system that converts the frequencies to some sort of um, uh, weighted score. And so you, you weight the score um, of the frequency that's observed versus the background probability of seeing that frequency. <coughs> so by and large, most of the time you see the use of, of matrix models they're going to assume that the genome is 25% A, 25% C, 25% G, and 25% T. Uh, if you're working in an organism that is rapid, you know, massively outside of that, that range, uh, then you would probably want to retune your, your matrix models to, to use that, uh, that background frequency. But most of the time, it's assumed to be 25%. Um, and it's a log uh, converted scale. And what that allows us to do is some co computationally efficient tools because we can add logs to get a score as opposed to dealing with uh, more computationally intensive uh, multiplication steps if we want to get a prob total probability. So this matrix here um, gets through this conversion, gets converted to this matrix over here. Now you'll notice this, this S value over here. Uh, that's called a, a pseudo value in the system. And the reason that you have a pseudo value is um, is varied. So some people say it's a weight for the confidence in the pattern, uh, and some people um, uh, say that it's because if you take a log of zero, uh, you have a problem. And so you're going to have to stick some value in there. And the way that convert that uh, pseudo count score is given varies uh, from tool to tool, but usually it's something like one over the number of sequences that are contributing to the frequency matrix. So for instance, you'd add a pseudo value in this one of 0.2 
to each of those zeros, which reflects that you're not absolutely confident that those zeros are there. If you have a thousand sequences and you add one over a thousand, which says, okay, the zero is probably really zero uh, in the matrix. Okay, so now you have this position-specific position, position -specific scoring matrix, often called a possum. So you'll hear a possum mentioned a few times over the next uh, 24 hours. Um, now, given any sequence, any DNA sequence, we can assign a score to it. And we can assign the score to it by simply taking the corresponding cells from the matrix for the given nucleotides. Do we have any questions so far? Okay. So you sum up the scores and you get a total score for the sequence. So here's, um, here's a couple comments about those scores. Um, this is a matrix for SP1, the popular study transcription factor. Here's the position that we're scoring. We take the corresponding cells, we add them up, and that gives us some sort of absolute score. The um, absolute scores vary depending on the matrix. So it depends on the width of the matrix. It depends on the um, uh, amount of sequences that you had contributing to the matrix. So the absolute score in and of itself is specific to the matrix and doesn't have any meaning to you if you're trying to generalize uh, across a database of matrices. Um, what you'll often see, though not always see, in the, in the tools that you find will be the use of relative scores. And a relative score essentially places this uh, on a spectrum of 0% being the minimum score and 100% being the maximum score. And so it's essentially a statement of the range, um, where you fall within the range of possible scores. And the nice thing about, absolutes, about relative scores is that you can now apply them to any matrix uh, and, and use it. Um, so you'll see some tools that will use relative scores. Um, there's an increasing uh, use of empirical p-value scores. So instead of taking the relative score, they generate, they take a pool of sequence of some sort, uh, and they have to define what that pool of sequence is. They take a pool of some sequence, and they generate the distribution of the scores. And what you're going to see in almost all uh, possums is that the distribution is an extreme value distribution. So it looks a little bit like a Gaussian, but it has a long tail to the right. Um, and so what they'll then do is take uh, some sort of threshold that's based on the um, uh, distribution, and they'll determine an empirical p-value, which essentially is the amount of, of sequence that you're allowing, amount of the, the area under the curve that you're allowing to the right. So those will be p-values. Um, I'm not terribly fond of the p-value representation because it makes you think that there's some sort of significance uh, to it. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why I think that you need to be careful with both interpretations of both of these in a moment. Okay, there are lots, there are several databases of these profiles, and that's where it becomes interesting to you because all of a sudden you have databases of these things that let you take a gene list and look to see within these gene lists whether there's sets of, of these profiles that are showing enrichment on your gene list. There are the, the old timer is TransFAC, uh, Jasper's one that my group makes. Um, there's a few others that have come out over the last few years that are quite good. So there's one called Swiss Regulon, uh, which is from Switzerland, which is a good quality one. Uh, there's a group in Russia that's been doing a very nice job lately with one called Hokomoko. Uh, so there's, uh, and Hokomoko basically tries to go to several of the databases and go and pull out all the profiles they can get and combine them together. And then there's a, a, another type of data which is available through the Uniprobe database, uh, which is a, a uh, a protein binding array uh, type format, which I, I'm not going to get into the details of. If you're interested, I can, I can talk about it. Um, okay, so you can go and find databases of these, these profiles. Uh, there's a few hundreds of them available, a few hundreds of the profiles uh, that are, are high quality. Uh, for the protein binding arrays, there you can go up to a, a larger sets. Um, they have some slight differences in characteristics from the other, one, in the other, other profiles. Okay, so let's go through the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, the good is that um, when you test these predicted sequences uh, in vitro, generally the protein will stick to them. So if you call it as a binding site using one of these tools uh, and you test whether the protein will stick to it, the protein will stick to it. Um, and there's been shown repeatedly that there's a strong correlation between the score and the binding energy of the factor. So that as you look at the, the strongest sites, um, the binding energy at the upper end uh, is correlated with the, the score itself. That sounds pretty good. Uh, the bad. Um, Fickett uh, and others have shown that these profiles make predictions all over the place. 
So when you take one of these tools and you apply it to a sequence, you're going to make predictions all the time. And it's not hard to think about why. So you're looking at a pattern that's a relatively small pattern with a relatively few <coughs> positions that are highly informed. And now you're going to look at a genome, which is a multi-billion base pair genome. And you're going to say, okay, how often am I going to expect, and it's double-stranded. And now how often am I going to expect it by chance? And the reality is, depending on your thresholds, you're going to see predictions every, for each profile, you're going to see predictions everywhere from one every 500 base pairs to one every few thousand base pairs. So when you say you're going to analyze your gene and you might take a 10,000 base pair gene, even in the best cases, you're probably going to make four or five predictions of binding sites for any given transcription factor. And for some transcription factors, you might make uh, 100 predictions within it. And that leads to the ugly, which is that if you scan a piece of DNA with these things, you're going to see predictions all over the place. And so we have a specificity problem. Um, and we know from the good part that the specificity problem isn't really inherent to the matrix itself, because the matrix is reflecting what the protein will stick to. What we know in now, as we think about this going backwards, is that in order for that protein to stick to that piece of DNA, it's got to be able to get there. And so if that piece of DNA is locked away and sequestered under chromatin structure where the proteins can't really get in there, it's not going to stick. And if it's in an open and accessible region, then the protein's going to have a chance to get there and, and hang around. So when we use these types of methods, we're working in the dark unless we combine them with additional layers of information. That's pretty important. Okay. This is my futility conjuncture that says binding site predictions are almost always wrong. Uh, and there have been all sorts of papers written all over the years, still a few coming through today, where people will say, okay, I'm going to take some bulk set of transcription factors, I'm going to scan some bulk set of genomes, and I'm going to make some prodigious claim about how important something is. Uh, and the reality is you're reflecting a bunch of junk, and so it's, you're reflecting some other property. Okay, there's a conundrum um, with this data, and that is that counter to intuition, the ratio of true positives to predictions fails to improve for stringent thresholds. So what's that mean? It means that there's a natural tendency anytime you're using a tool, particularly an informatics tool, to say that if I take a more stringent cutoff, I'm going to get better results. So I will take less, but they're going to be better. Um, and in transcription factor binding sites, that actually isn't terribly true uh, beyond a certain point. And so what you see in transcription factor binding sites is that for a while, the, you do get improving positive predictive value, meaning the proportion of the predictions that are, are correct. Um, but there's a, a point where you no longer get an improvement in positive predictive value. So why is that? Um, it's because two things. One is transcription factors um, don't have to have the perfect binding site to stick to it. So they can stick to a sequence with a less than perfect binding site. It just means they're binding with less energy. But that doesn't mean it's any less biologically relevant that that transcription factor is getting there. And in fact, there's literature to show that sometimes these transcription factor binding sites have been tuned to get the transcription factor at the right amount, uh, the right levels there. And so functional sites may very well be you know, evolutionarily selected to be less than optimal and still functionally true. So that's one key piece. There's one other piece to think about. Um, and this relates to the nature of how transcription factors work. And so there's a tendency with transcription factors to think going back to our very first slide where we were talking about them, that they come from outer space, they land on the genome at the, exactly the right spot, and they decide whether they stick there or not. Now, that's not how it works. So how does it work? Um, I had a, a science illustrator come into my lab a, a, year, a couple years ago, and she made this really cool video. So if you're, you're looking at YouTube at all, you can go and look up Sproma. Um, uh, stroma videos. I'll show it later just for fun. Uh, but basically, the way transcription factors work is they load onto the DNA in a non-specific fashion. And so they're interacting with the helical backbone of the DNA. They then slide along the DNA, um, essentially along the backbone, engaged in the DNA in a non-specific non energy format, sticking to DNA. When they get to a point where it's convenient for them to bind, they will have the potential to, to bind and interact with the bases inside the, the helix and stably stabilize and be, be there for a while. Um, so what you're seeing here is a paper by uh, Quake and Merkel. Um, and what they did was they predicted the binding energy using matrix models, basically, on the x-axis. And they measured it 
this was an exquisite experiment. They actually measured the binding energy for each of these different sequences uh, using a microfluidic uh, system that they've developed. Um, and what you see is that the, there's a correlation between the predicted binding score and the measured binding score up to a point. And then all of a sudden you see that it sort of flattens out. And what you're seeing there is, they didn't state this in their paper, but I'll tell you what you're seeing there. What you're seeing there is the nonspecific energy. So at some point, the binding site is not good enough, and you're engaging in the DNA with a nonspecific uh, energy. And so your matrix models are, you know, are improving, the positive predictive value is improving through this stretch uh, because you're going, transitioning from a, a nonspecific interaction to a specific interaction. Uh, but across here, it's really about what's the functionally most desirable sequence, what's the genome doing, what's the uh, sequence variability, what's the mutations that are accumulating, all sorts of other issues about, about where it's going to fall within that data. Okay, so now you have a better understanding about where that, that data is coming from. Um, just to, to scare you a little bit, uh, there's a, a very cool researcher in, um, in Sweden, his name is Johan Elf. And he has actually been uh, visualizing transcription factors at a single molecule level in the nucleus uh, to see how they are interacting with DNA uh, and also naked DNA. And what he's shown is that they essentially don't stick. So transcription factors, despite the way we think about them and our whole view of them sticking, is that they stick for, rel in, the, in the cell, they stick for microseconds. And so the question becomes, what's this whole view of transcription factors that we have when the evidence is saying that they stick for microseconds onto these spots. Um, and so there's a whole new wave of, of research going on to, or being initiated to say, okay, are they really just coming in here and sort of maintaining some sort of epigenetic state on the region so that you have a continuing flow of transcription factors over the region? Is um, that related then to why uh, things level up and we kill a cow, kill calories for more? Like, is there something? So this is this is particular about that plateau, or is that just what they saw? No, that's just the, that sticking to the backbone versus sticking inside the helix is all that you're seeing here. Okay. Um, so they in those studies they will they engineer um, the specific target sites of the factors. Um, now who knows if the, it's reflecting you know multi-protein complexes whether you might get some additional stabilization effects and that multiple proteins might stick together longer. Uh, but by and large, it seems to be a, a when you get to the biophysical crowd, uh, the, the trend right now is to think about these things as, as very brief visitors uh, to a location. Okay. So uh, what have we learned in this section? Um, matrices reflect in vitro binding properties pretty well. Um, suitable binding sites occur far too frequently to reflect in vivo function. And bioinformatics methods that look use position-specific matrices for binding site studies are going to have to bring in additional information. Okay, I'm going to flip through these slides ultra fast because it's a slightly older methodology, uh, but it's just to convey to you how that you can use methods to filter on. So phylogenetic footprinting is a conservation-based approach to say, okay, some regulatory sequences are conserved over, over evolution. So if we look at, uh, at conservation patterns of a gene, you can see that coding sequences are well conserved, and then you see some other evidence that certain regulatory sequences are conserved. The data right now suggests that maybe a third of regulatory sequences have a strong evolutionary component, and about two-thirds seem to be very highly variable across uh, species. Depends on the factors and depends on the context, but by and large, only a portion of them uh, are conserved. Um, this just shows you the futility plot again and says that if you filter that uh, to focus on those regions, where there's a strong pattern of conservation, you can greatly reduce the number of predictions and you can focus your attention a bit. And this says that you can get rid of about 90% of the predictions using that type of methodology. And you can use FASTCON scores for doing this, and there are tools online that you can use for, for doing this. And there's some links in the system here to, to some of the tools that allow you to, to do that type of analysis. Okay, and there's some additional uh, tools that are available for doing those things. Okay, now the same concept for phylogenetic footprinting can be used with uh, epigenetics data. And so there are additional tools that allow you to filter based on either DNA hypersensitivity open regions, uh, DNA, uh, chipped uh, regions, and the like to focus your attention to the key regions. Okay. Now, let's, sorry for that fast one, but that's 
quick foray. I want to now take a few moments to introduce you to the discovery of patterns, and then we're going to dive into a lab where you're actually going to do this. So, so perk up and pay attention because you're going to need it for a minute to, to do the lab exercise, um, and then we'll get underway. So de novo discovery of transcription factor binding sites. So you have some ChIP-seq experiment where you've uh, generated your, your high throughput sequencing reaction, you've pulled out your regions that are, are bound by your protein, and now you want to know, okay, what is the pattern that this protein sticks to? Can I generate a matrix for my protein? So given a set of sequences, find the pattern that's enriched within those sequences. In large part, there's two primary types of tools that do this. There are string-based tools and profile-based tools. Depending on the species you're working on, you may find more tools of one kind than the other. Um, I'm, I'm biased to profile-based tools, but string-based tools can have been proven to be effective uh, in a similar way. So basically, in a string-based tool, you're looking at overrepresented algomers. So basically, you say, let's look at every possible combination of, of letters, determine this enrichment of those that string of letters in the foreground versus background and give it a p-value to the, the, that pattern. In a profile-based system, you're rather than looking at each possible string of letters, you're looking at a matrix-based model where it's a quantitative representation. So the difference here is really whether you look at your data through a, 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 a word or through a, a matrix. And I'm going to go into each one of these in some more detail here for you, for you to get through. Okay. And then we have some issues of assessing what's, what's the right pattern. Okay, so let's take a look at string-based methods. These are the oldest. Um, they are given renewed um, strength because of advances in memory and compute power. So basically what you can do is you can take a string of a certain number of characters and you can test every possible string. And you can do it now with not just ACs, Gs, and Ts, but you can also use IUPAC uh, degeneracy codes. So you can use Rs and Ws and the like to say which patterns show up more in the foreground than the background. So for instance, how likely is it to find a X number of words in a set of sequences given the background? So it's a similar concept, foreground, background, that we talked about before. And so what you'll do is you'll say, here's my sequences. Uh, let me count how many times I've seen each of the pattern. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do is that you need to have some sort of sense of background. And so in background, what you'll do is you say, okay, here's, here's the type of sequences that I'm looking for. So, for instance, if you're working in yeast, you might take all the promoters within the yeast genome and say, what's the background frequency of each possible build code? So you say, okay, and all across all yeast promoters, I find T, 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 um, 57,788 times. So now if you find T, 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 T in, in large numbers in your ChIP-seq data set, you may not be so impressed because it occurred 57,000 times uh, in yeast promoters. Whereas if you find an equal number of AAACCTTT in your ChIP-seq data, well, you know in the background it was only there 456 times. And so you finding a, a large number of these in a data set is going to be more meaningful than finding an equally large number of these in the data set because you know the background is high. I see a couple confused looks. Um, essentially, it's a lookup table process where you say, for each pattern, AAAA, AAAC, AAAG, AAAT, how many times do we find that pattern in the background? And then you do the same thing with your, your data set. You say A, 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 how many times do I find it? And then you calculate a, a, um, a p-value for it. So you have a measure of the variance of the patterns, and you calculate a, a z-score, essentially how many standard deviations are you away from the, the frequency of the pattern uh, in your data set. Um, Okay, why am I not a big fan of string-based methods? Um, we lose quantitation. So basically, transcription factors show strong biases for certain patterns, and we lose that characteristic when we use string-based methods. So if you use a degeneracy code like a W, you're saying there's a 50% A and a 50% T, but in the reality of the transcription factor, you may see that it's 95% A and 5% T, uh, and so you have a stronger pattern to look for uh, when you work with quantitative approaches. Um, but the string-based methods have been in particular extremely popular in the study of microRNAs and RNA binding proteins. Uh, and so they've been shown most of the tools that use for microRNA uh, analysis are string-based methods. So if that's your world, uh, string-based methods are probably what you're facing. Uh, 
Um, there's a couple of, of links to that. Okay, so let's look at a matrix method, and in particular, let's look at probabilistic methods, and then I'll show you the, the expectation maximization variant of it that you're going to use in the, the exercise in a couple moments. Okay, so the matrix-based methods, we want to find a local alignment of width x of sites that maximize information content or some other related measure in a reasonable time. And almost all of these methods are either an expectation maximization or Gibbs sampling method, and I'm going to walk you through a Gibbs sampling version, and then I'll tell you how EM is a simplification of that. Um, it, in general, the, the uh, profile-based methods can look for longer patterns than string-based methods, because after you, each time you add a character to your string, you're adding uh, a four times more requirement for compute and, and, uh, and memory. Um, and another piece of this that's useful is you can, can create certain um, influences on the process which you're not going to use. Okay, so here we're going to work through our problem. So imagine that you have a set of sequences that have come from your ChIP-seq experiment, and you are going to try to discover the pattern that's within them. So we're going to have the sites that you've called within the sequences, you're going to have the locations of those sites within the sequences, and you're going to have the sequences themselves. So that's your data set, the types of data and the information that you're tracking in the, in the method. Okay. Let's see if I've got it on the... There we go. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in a Gibbs sampling method, what we're first going to do is we're going to guess where all the, the sites are in the sequences. And that sounds, a, sounds silly, but we're just going to guess. No truth to this at all. We're just going to say, okay, one, one site here, one site here, one site here, and we're going to randomly place them. And then what you'll do is you'll say, okay, uh, for one sequence, uh, let's, try, let's build a, a model based on the sequences we guessed, and the model is mostly going to be junk. Uh, and then you're going to say, okay, let's throw out one of our guesses. Okay, well, let's take a sequence, we'll throw out one of the guesses, and we'll score that sequence with the model that we've created. And so now we have uh, matrix scores, like we talked about before, along that sequence. And that junk model is going to be somewhat noisy. There's going to be peaks in several places. It's going to be uh, not a very strong pattern. And then what we can do is say, okay, now in the sequence that we're working with, let's choose a new site within it. And so if you, you can choose the site probabilistically and say, okay, we'll choose a site based on the, the area under the curve of the peaks. Or you can choose it under sort of an EM method where you say, okay, I just want the best peak. So you'll take the best peak here. Um, if you're doing a full EM system, you can, rather than guessing the initial positions, you can take as some, some sort of base string that's, that's the most abundant string as your, your initial guess. Now, what happens is that most of the time you wander in the forest, right? You're just bumping into nothing, and you're not getting anywhere. But occasionally you get a site that's a real site that's enriched in the sequence. And what that does is that little bit of bias of having that real site in the data, in the matrix, makes it very probable that the next sequence that you work on, you'll get something that's a little bit more like that. And then when you've got two of the sites within the sequence, in the sequence set that look like it, that matrix gets more specialized. And so while it wanders around for a long time without getting anywhere, every so often it gets a couple of sequences in there and it zooms right in to the pattern that it's looking for. And so when you're running these types of probabilistic methods, what you'll see is that you launch them 10,000 times. So you start them 10,000 times because they're going to, and you're going to run them for a relatively small number of cycles. Uh, and they're going to, to stabilize, but they're going to, each time it's going to stabilize on a different pattern and you keep the strongest patterns that it stabilizes on. Uh, with expectation maximization, it loses that random step to it because you're going to choose the sort of initial seed sets that are the best, um, and it will give you the same result every time, which some people prefer, uh, but it, has the, it doesn't generate as much variability uh, as weaker patterns coming through. Okay, so here it is once more. Uh, take a bunch of sequences, randomly paste binding sites on them, generate a matrix model out of those binding sites, remove one of the sequences from the set, erase the binding set that was used there, score it, choose a position within that to take the binding site for that sequence from, return that to the pool, and do it over and over and over again. If you are, um, okay, so I think you have a sense of how that's working. So 
these types of methods are guaranteed to return an optimal pattern if repeated sufficiently often. Uh, of course, we may not repeat them sufficiently often because we don't want to, to spend that much time on them. Uh, but by and large, they, they do very well. Um, you'll run it many thousands of times to avoid uh, local minima. And we are constrained because if the mediating transcription factor binding site or whatever pattern you're looking for is not strongly enriched in the data set, you're not going to get it. So if your data is lousy and noisy, you're not going to get a magical pattern back. If your data is clean, then almost any of these methods are going to work. If your data is somewhere in between, uh, depend, you'll sort of have to optimize the process to get, get the best result. <coughs> now, you've all got this on your, your handout, so it's not a secret, but basically the test to see how well these types of things are doing is usually add noise. So here you can take a binding site from F2, which is a fairly stringent, specific type of transcription factor, and we can test it with increasing amounts of, of flanking sequence. And we can see how long we can go until we lose our ability to recover the pattern that we are started with. And the unfortunate reality is that by the time you add about 500 base pairs of flanking sequence, you're getting pretty far down on your capacity to pull out the pattern. So these transcription factor binding sites and the discovery of the patterns is not hugely tolerant of noise. You need your data sets to be relatively clean. When we were doing chip-chip type experiments, it was a mess because chip-chip studies didn't reveal, didn't focus the data very well, and so you'd end up with very large regions. When you're doing chip-seq sequences, they do a much nicer job. And so while there's some peaks that are very large, uh, we have a relatively small high confidence zone around them, which is, is quite good. Uh, and I'll show you a figure a little bit later on uh, just to convey that after you've uh, developed, uh, gone through the meme exercise. Okay. So how do you improve sensitivity? Um, better background models help. Uh, you can use conservation if you uh, so choose. Uh, you can, there's some advanced methods using combinations, which I'll mention tomorrow in our, our systems approach. Um, you can constrain the analysis type, uh, but primarily is to focus on chip-seq data sets. And so almost everything you see now is going to be on chip-seq data sets. Okay. Okay, so our focus for the afternoon for the next period of time is to look at motif overrepresentation. So in the morning section, we were talking about motif discovery, where we, were, we didn't know anything about our motif. Uh, we just had a bunch of sequence, and we wanted to see what new patterns came up from that sequence. But as we move along in the world of, of the study of regulatory sequences in the genome, uh, increasingly we have an idea of what most of the transcription factors are, and we have a better and better idea of what their binding sites are looking like. And so in 10 years' time, we shouldn't, really shouldn't have to discover patterns from scratch. We should be able to just use known patterns for our analysis. So there have been um, a variety of tools created that now, instead of looking for the new patterns, just say, are there old patterns that are enriched here? So we're going to take a look into that world. So inferring regulating transcription factors for sets of co-expressed genes. The input here can either be um, uh, gene names, which we'll work with, so you can take your gene list and plug it in, or you may choose to restrict your attention to certain regions of genes. For instance, you have chip data of epigenetic chip or DNA hypersensitivity or phantom enhancers or other types of things that lead you to, to focus on those, those specific regions. Most of what we'll talk about is gene name focused, um, and then we can, we'll do an exercise with some of the other ones as well. Okay, so in this context, we have some co-expressed genes, and we have some sort of background. So we're going to have some idea, just like before, that there's some foreground and there's some background, and we're trying to say, is there something different about the genes in the foreground um, compared to the genes in the background? And so what you're hoping to say is that there's some known motif, and then if we look we're going to see lots of binding sites predicted for that motif in the, the foreground genes and not so many in the background. Now, as I've told you earlier today, you know that it's not going to look like this, right? Because these binding sites make predictions all over the place, and so you're going to have an awful lot of noise in this process, and so it's going to be much more a matter of statistical enrichment rather than the obvious uh, visual enrichment that you're looking at on the screen. Okay, so you're going to hear a lot about Go term over representation analysis tomorrow and the next day. 
Um, and in those conversations, you're going to hear be given some introduction to the, the base statistics that are used for these types of analyses. I'll mention them here briefly, uh, but you'll get them in more depth than you probably desire tomorrow uh, about the, the statistics. Okay. When we do this, there's really two distinct statistics that we are using in this analysis. Um, there's a third that I'll mention on the sequence-based methods, but on the, on the gene name-based methods, um, there's two major ones. So the first one is you simply saying, are there more genes with the pattern in the foreground than there are genes with the pattern in the background? And that works when you have relatively clean data like this. There's a relatively strong motif. You're focusing on relatively short pieces of sequence next to the genes. But for many factors, they are not that specific. And if you're looking at slightly longer sequences, you're going to have a chance hit on, on large numbers of them. And so another statistic that we're going to use is measuring uh, a measure of enrichment, which is a measure of how many total binding sites are in the foreground set, as opposed to how many total binding sites are in the background set, converted to a rate so that you have it per base pair. So that if you have longer sequences in one set, obviously you don't want to have that, that outweigh. So what's that do for you? Well, for strong patterns, it might pop best up best in, in this um, uh, measure. And for weaker patterns, it may come up best uh, with this measure. So for doing this, we're going to use a, a, a Fisher test, essentially sort of the classic two by two table test on the right hand side. And on the left side, um, we're going to be basing ourselves on a, a hypergeometric uh, testing procedure. So uh, we'll calculate a z-score and standard deviations for the, the number of occurrences, um, and we'll use the, uh, the number of genes with the, the fissure. Sorry, I got the backwards one I mentioned. OK, so I'm going to describe to you the opossum tool, which is the tool that my lab's created, not because it's the best tool in the universe, uh, which it is, uh, but because it is the tool that I understand better than anything else. That said, um, when I tried it out a few minutes ago, the web server wasn't working for Opossum, and the, the lab staff is trying to bring it up, so we may be using PCHIP, which is another tool of similar venture. And you will also find these types of enrichment analysis tools uh, available on other, other systems. So there's, they all generalize to the same concept. Uh, it's just a matter of which interface you like better uh, to get there. So what's it do? Well, it takes as input your set of genes. It goes to the ensemble database and pulls out the sequences and has those available. It then scans those sequences with the database of, um, uh, well, in this case, we use a, the base opossum system is a phylogenetic footprinting system. So we focus on conserved regions uh, in the opossum system. So we align the human and mouse sequences, or in this case, we actually use the multi-sequence alignments that are available. Um, and calculate a conservation score. Focused on the conserved regions, we pull out and scan it with the database of transcription factor binding profiles. So we take all of those possum matrices that we can get. Uh, we scan through and say how many times do we see binding sites and where do we see binding sites. Then we calculate a statistic of significance and we return a, a ranked list of potentially mediating transcription factors. So. The types of results that you will have will differ depending on which statistic you use. So each statistic will favor a certain type of transcription factor more than another. And so in general, it's good to look at a couple different ways of thinking about your regulation rather than expecting there to be a single ultimate ranked list uh, within the tool. So this is uh, an analysis um, with a couple of reference uh, gene sets. Um, this is a set of skeletal muscle specific genes. and. These are classic skeletal muscle transcription factors. This was a set of hepatocyte-specific genes, and these are, are classic hepatocyte transcription factors. So when you give it a perfectly clean data list, it does a beautiful job. Uh, like most tools, when you give it noise, it's going to get uh, worse and worse as it goes along. And so it's really a matter of how far can you go to still get things that you like. Um, we've been uh, representing it more and more using uh, these types of plots, where you see um, the, the two different metrics along the different axes, so that you can plot your results um, using a, a, the Fisher p-value along one axis and the z-score along the other actress, axis. And in this case, um, the optimal positions are up towards the left. And so those things that are coming out. Now, what we ran here were three different data sets. And so it's a little confusing because 
the green one was related to NF kappa B regulation, and you see NF kappa B profiles coming out. The pink one was related to hepatocyte regulation, and you see hepatocyte related profiles. And the blue ones was related to muscle, and you see blue muscle related ones. So there's three different data results on the same plot. How, how would you interpret what, what might it be a sign of going wrong if you see, if you see uh, points that aren't more or less along that? So what you would see is that you might see a, um, a Z score uh, that is striking, a Z score that is striking uh, without having a, a strong Fisher test result. If you have a profile that has got a um, um, one gene gives you a saturating number of binding sites for it. So for instance, you had one of your sequences that just had the binding site over and over and over and over and over again, it would be there at total in your data set as a very large number. Um, but it would not show up as being enriched across all the genes that you're looking at. So those types of biases can, can push you up into that, that end. Um, in general, um, the opposite is you don't see so much, and I don't know where it would come from. It probably, would probably I have to think about it, it might be the opposite end. So you might have sort of an extremely high information content profile, meaning that it makes almost no predictions. Um, so that it wouldn't have very many, but the one but the fact that it's not had any in the in the one gene might be enough to skew the results. I'd have to, to try it out and see if we could skew the data to get there. Okay. So the opossum server that we'll use in a little while, uh, hopefully. Um, has a bunch of different flavors to it. Uh, and we're going to try a very simple version of it within the system. Um, so basically, because it's a bunch of pre-computed things, uh, you choose the organism that you're interested in working on, because it, it has a database behind it. And then it has a series of different options in terms of types of analyses. So we're going to focus today on single site analysis, which means we're going to look at one pattern at a time. So each pattern within there is treated in isolation. Um, an anchored combination site analysis means that you say there's one factor that I already know is interesting, and I'm going to look in the vicinity of the binding sites for that factor to see if I can find anything else. And so, for instance, you might have ChIP-seq data that you're looking at in the, in the sequence analysis version of it. You might have ChIP-seq related data, and you already know that you did an antibody for that transcription factor, and you want to see if there's another binding site for a different transcription factor that shows up nearby. Um, this one um, is based on the TFBS cluster analysis and the um, anchored clustered analysis are both based on searching for sets of transcription factors that are showing up as enriched. So it doesn't, you don't uh, necessarily have to start with one that you're interested in, but it doesn't. Both of these are computationally extraordinarily slow, and if we run those, we'll crash the system completely today. So we'll focus on the first two. For all other organisms, or? Yeah, so sequence based means that you provide the sequence. And so it's uh, agnostic about organisms. It doesn't care what organism you have. It, you just give it sequence and it will run on it. And how, what is it for matching it for the transcription factor? Like, um... Yeah, so you're constrained by the databases of transcription factors. Um, within the system here, we're using the Jasper database of profiles. <laughs> and that one has. Uh, human and mouse basically are a shared set within that, so we treat the human and mouse factors as, as you know, from the same database. Um, there's a small set of fly profiles, uh, an even smaller set of worm profiles. Basically, blast against oh. all the, matches against all the known transcription factors? For the, uh, for the human and mouse, it, it goes against the uh, vertebrate tr transcription factors. But for the sequence based? For the sequence based, you de define which subset that you want to work on. So we'll try that out in the uh, integrated assignment today uh, to go ahead and try the, the sequence-based analysis. Good questions. Now, we've talked a little bit about backgrounds earlier on motif discovery. And I will tell you that motif matters just as much when you're coming and looking at uh, motif enrichment. And so what you're seeing here is um, the same foreground data set with three different background data sets. Um, what you're plotting along here is the z-score, so one of those two statistics along the y-axis. 
And what you see plotted along the x-axis is the GC composition of the profile. So did the logo have a lot of GC or a lot of AT uh, in it? And this one um, has an elevated uh, GC in the background. And so when you have a lot of GC in the background, GC patterns don't seem as important. <coughs> but AT patterns become extremely important. And when you have uh, the converse and you have a low GC in the background, meaning it's a low GC content overall, you see the same characteristic. And so what you really want to do is have a matched background so that the background that you're using is consistent um, with the foreground that you're using. Now, that is um, been facilitated by some tools that have been created um, in the system uh, for now, so that there is an option in the system to generate matched backgrounds. And you can take the matched backgrounds out of the opossum system and use them elsewhere, so that if you want the matched backgrounds, you can do it. Most of the tools don't do anything to correct for the backgrounds. And so what you'll see when you look at results, imagine that you ran this one and you took this set as your, your analysis and your foreground and your background looked like this. What you would then see, and this was a uh, chip-seq experiment against a transcription factor called NFE2R2, NFE2L2, or also known as NRF2. Um, and what you would say is the, the best scoring profiles were this one and this one and this one because they were AT-rich profiles in, against a GC background. So the fact, the profile that we're looking for gets buried it's fourth in the, the list coming down relative to the others. Likewise, you can see that it, it's, it's, there's a skew here, but in this case, the NRF2 profile was sufficiently above it that it would still come out as being heavily enriched against the background. Now, what is key here is that there's a secondary factor that also acts on a subset of NRF2 binding sites. It's called AP1. It's a common factor called, it's known as C-June, uh, C-June and FOSS. Um, and what you see is that the AP1 motif, if you're running against a GC background that's uh, with a, a high GC, it's so far down in the list you're never going to get there. When you uh, run in this one, it's still pretty far down in the list and you might or might not get down far enough to, to give it any attention. But after you get the background straightened out and balanced and corrected for, you're going to see that emerge as being uh, higher enough against the noise to pull it out. So this type of problem is um, common within the analysis of, of enrichment of regulatory sequences. And the reason is that we have a great disparity in CG composition around gene promoters. Um, and because of that great diversity of CG composition around gene promoters, uh, certain sets of genes will have very different characteristics than other genes. So for instance, how many of you have heard of CPG islands? Does anyone want to tell me what a CPG island is? Good. So CG dinucleotides are targets of methylation systems. Um, so what happens in most of the genomes? What happens to CG dinucleotides? Yeah, so in most of the genome outside of immediate promoter regions, CG dinucleotides are methylated. Uh, promoter regions, a subset of them are protected and have no methylation on them to keep them open and accessible. Now over evolutionary time, so this is over vast periods of, of time, over evolutionary periods of time, CG dinucleotides have a tendency to mutate. So if they're methylated, they have a tendency to mutate. So you'll get a C converting to an A, if I remember correctly. Um, and so what happens is that you selectively bias against CG dinucleotides across most of the genome. So you're wiping, you're eliminating them over evolutionary time. In promoter regions that are active, uh, you have a tendency to, to protect your CG dinucleotides. And so you have CG dinucleotides uh, that appear to be there uh, at a higher frequency than the rest of the genome. Now, the biggest common misperception is that you actually have higher CG dinucleotides. What you have is a, a reduced tendency to mutate your CG dinucleotides in, in promoter regions. Now, genes that are 
narrowly expressed late in differentiation. So genes that turn on in, as tissues mature uh, and regulatory sequences that are used after as tissues mature um, tend not to have such strong CG uh, island characteristics. And the reason for that is that the genome as we see it is established in the germ cells which are established in the first few divisions, relatively first few divisions of the developing embryo. So those things that are turning on late in the process are actually methylated in the early phases and are accumulating mutations as fast as the rest of the genome. So that's a long-winded way of saying that actually when you get into promoter analysis, CG dinucleotides really impact you on human and mouse studies because the genes that we usually care about uh, for most of us are genes that are involved in some sort of tissue or some sort of response or something where they turn on uh, in a specific time later on. And so we do have much greater diversity in CG content than we would, um, than we might expect to have. Okay. A challenge comes with this. So just because you have a name attached to a transcription factor that shows up in your list has no real information about whether that transcription factor is acting on your set of genes. And the reason for that is, is that with some exceptions, most transcription factors in the same structural class bind to very much similar sequences. So if you see a pattern like TGACTCA, well, it could be June, which is an AP1 transcription factor, could be June B, could be June D, could be FRA, could be FOSS. Some of the ATFs bind there, and so on and so forth. They're all leucine zipper class transcription factors. They all have very similar binding motifs. And the fact that that motif was enriched doesn't tell you which of that group is the one that's potentially acting on it. So you have to abstract your list to the context that you're looking at. So if you run your enrichment analysis and you say, OK, I got my results back, and I see this profile at the top, it's not to run off to your publication and stick it in your paper that says that was the factor that's acting on your system. It's to say, okay, that family of factors could have a role in here. And now I have to say which factor is likely to be active in the cells that I'm looking at uh, and could likely be mediating my response. So then you have to return to your expression data and your knowledge of the system and see which of the factors that might be most relevant um, are there. There's a massive exception to that, which are the zinc fingers which essentially are each their own unique binding characteristic. And so if you're hitting on a zinc finger transcription factor, you probably have a reasonable chance of sticking to the profile that you're, you're seeing. So this is just an example of the ETS family of transcription factors. Um, and these are um, seven profiles for distinct members of the ETS family. Uh, this one is, if you reverse complement, you'll notice it's going to look an awful lot like all the rest of these. And this is uh, sort of the common essence of ETS, just merging them all together and trying to show what's, what's there. So there's been some work on building uh, classifications of transcription factors and organizing them into hierarchies so people can now go back and work their way through the transcription factor sets and see which factors are, are in groups. And that's just a report on all the ETS-related factors in the system. And so if you hit on an S profile, you really need to do some extra work to figure out which one it is that's mediating. OK, so what have we covered so far? Um, there's tools to help interrogate the meaning of observed clusters of co-expressed genes. Um, I didn't say this, but I'll tell you now that this is not uh, perfection. And so if you have noisy, lousy data, you're not going to overcome it through this type of analysis. And so what's noisy, lousy data? Noisy, lousy data is to say, I'm going to throw a growth factor on my system, and in 14 days, I'm going to come back and see which genes are expressed. Uh, because you're looking at not a primary response, but you're looking at a secondary and a tertiary and a quaternary response layered on top of each other. And so with, when you're looking for regulatory cues and regulatory signatures, you generally want to be looking in relatively short periods of time after some sort of action. So if you're looking at a differentiation, you'd like to have as homogeneous a system as you can so that you're looking at things that are more or less equivalent to each other. If you're looking at some sort of activated response where you're treating your cells with something, you'd like to look um, in relatively short time periods, meaning depends on the system, of course. Uh, I've seen everything from, from 
an hour to, to 16, 24 hours be successful in these types of analyses. But when you start going out multiple days, uh, you generally have too much noise in your system to, to pull things back. Okay, so we're, we're transitioning into regulatory networks. And regulatory networks is a, a, a gigantic field, and, and we're not going to get to super advanced methodology in this class because mostly it's, it's pretty much programming, programming access to do it. But what we're really going to focus on when we talk about regulatory networks here are two, phase, two pieces. One is uh, looking how sets of factors are acting together. So we're going to look to see if we can find uh, multiple factors that are contributing to a regulatory control system. And then we're also going to look to see what are the commonalities of the genes that are subject to the same regulatory program. So how do we take a set of genes that are, are sharing a, a regulatory signature, either in this case uh, sharing a chip uh, domain, uh, but also you could have the same, same methodology applied for uh, gene and co-gene expression, which you'll see uh, later in the day. Okay, so but we're going to seek insights into networks through the analysis of regulatory sequences. I've mentioned the two major concepts that we're going to poke, but just once again, cooperativity of transcription factors, so multiple tra transcription factors acting together, and then uh, identify biological networks that may be associated with genomic locations. And we'll try to cover the basics in this section, and then we'll try to cover the applied in the next, in the lab steps. Uh, a few follow-ups from yesterday, just to cover a couple of the details that, that were going on. Um, so there were a few questions yesterday related to the scoring uh, statistics. Uh, you're going to get them again in, from Quaid in terms of the different statistics that are used. But, but loosely, uh, the Z-score that you were using yesterday is comparing the rate of occurrence of a binding site in the target set to the rate of um, occurrence in the uh, background genes. And the Fisher score uh, is comparing the proportion of genes containing a binding site to the proportion of the background set. So this one is, you know, how many binding sites are there, and this is how many genes have binding sites. I have a sort of follow-up question. Um, so sometimes if your background set doesn't have one of your target set genes, the single site analysis says you're going to get like an infinite z-score or something, yeah. something that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. In those cases, is it worth trying to rerun the analysis, like if you're trying to be most comprehensive about your... There's, there's sort of two ways that you end up in that situation. So one is either that you have an extreme profile, uh, and those ones are very hard to, to make sense of in these types of tools, meaning that it's, you know, wide and, and strong patterns, and you only see a pattern once every 50,000 base pairs or so. Uh, and the other piece that contributes to that is if you have a very small set of sequences that you're analyzing. Um, and so, in general, you can try to rerun it. You could lower your threshold uh, slightly, and you could see what's happening with those ones. But um, my general statement would be, you're probably not going to get any uh, reliable data out of it. Um, so I'd probably just skip them. OK, uh, there were also some uh, domain-specific requests for information. So people who were interested in doing regulatory analysis are a couple different species. So the, uh, the two that were mentioned, there was a question on insects. And there's a tool that I quite like for flies. It's called um, ISIS Target. Um, so the ISIS Target is a package developed by Stein Ertz in Belgium. And it's a, it's a software package that you download, but it's, it runs very easily. It's nicely maintained. Uh, and it allows you to do a lot of the same sorts of things that we were doing uh, online uh, for, for fly analysis. And it's just a very uh, convenient uh, tool to use. Uh, the other group that uh, was across, there was an interest in bacterial work. I know that Regnion DB is probably an aware uh, tool out there. Uh, it seems to be the, the richest one for the, the mi microbial bacterial world. Um, what Regulon DB really is doing uh, for regulation analysis is it's wrapping a package called RSAT. So it's the Regulatory Sequence Analysis Toolkit. Uh, and RSAT is, can be applied to any species, but um, is, is sort of uh, incorporates the information in Regulon DB for, for binding profiles. So if you're bacteria or fly, there's a couple resources for you. And if you didn't ask me yesterday for resources and you have a particular domain that was underrepresented, make sure you ask me today and I'll, I'll look it up and, and put some information up for you on the system. There was also some conversation yesterday around transcription factor grouping. 
so this idea that you get a, a signature uh, pattern that says, okay, it looks like it might be a forkhead transcription factor, but then you know, what are the forkhead transcription factors? Um, so there's um, a few places to go to get some more information about transcription factors. The most relevant for that particular problem is a system called DBD, or DNA Binding Domains, um, which is available at transcriptionfactor.org. Um, and that's a effort to, to curate uh, all the DNA binding transcription factors into subclasses. It was originally developed for flies, but has been then been extended to essentially all species that have an ensemble genome. So it's, uh, it's uh, maintenance comes and goes. Uh, so I think that it's, it's run by a lady named Sarah Teichman in Cambridge, uh, and she's, I think, working on a, a new release. So I'm not sure where they are right now, but it's coming along. Uh, TFE is a wiki project where they have, where we have, this one's I run, uh, individual little review articles written by experts on the field. Um, so if you have a chance to, to log into that, I noticed the system was down this morning because we're transitioning servers, so it, it'll be up again shortly. And then the uh, factor book uh, is the ENCODE-related project where they have the um, profiles and, and information that's been dated, generated out of the ENCODE project, so you can find a little bit more information in there. So just three additional resources for, for transcription factor information. Okay, so um, one, of the, the, one of the things that's emerging out of the ENCODE project and really where the state of the field is right now is how do we incorporate all these layers of information into the same type of analysis tool. So what you'd really ideally like to do is to say, I have epigenetics data, I have DNA successability data, I have DNA binding dope data, I have co-activator data, I have polymerase complex data, and you're getting all of this different information conservation data. Uh, and so you're getting all of these pieces thrown together, and you'd like to say, can I come bring those together and have an a interpretation of, of what regions in the genome are open and accessible and likely to be functioning as regulatory regions? Um, it is early days for those types of tools. So these are not friendly. These are not uh, polished web interfaces. They are dependent upon the data that's available. The different tools will have incorporated different pieces along the way. So I'm not saying we're not going to do a lab on these because this is, uh, this is sort of the bleeding edge where things are, are in the early stages. But if you're interested in those types of things, these are sort of the two better tools out there for incorporating this information. So they are, they are related. Um, in fact, uh, um, some of the authors actually are, appear on, on both papers. Um, the, the general idea is can you predict active regulatory regions in a given cell or tissue based on integrated analysis of diverse genome scale data. And the two tools that I highlighted here are Chrome HMM and Segway. And so these, these tools are ultimately um, about um, segmenting the, a genome into different classification groups. So they will say, okay, here's a whole genome sequence, and I'm going to believe that there's a series of states within that whole genome sequence. So a state might be a promoter region, a state might be uh, a coding exon, a state might be a, an intron, it might be a, a distal enhancer, and so on and so forth. And so you'd like to be able to say, okay, let's classify it all out into these different states in that given tissue. So both of these are segmentation type tools, or, cl or classifiers in that way. Um, they principally differ in the, the underlying statistical methodology. So Chrome HMM, uh, as the name suggests, uses a hidden Markov model for doing its work. Um, and the Segway system uses something called a dynamic Bayesian network. Uh, so you probably don't need to know about the, the underlying me methods within them, um, but they ultimately are trying to deal with the fact that you have incomplete data. So sometimes you have information in one region and you don't have information in other regions. And so the big challenge is here is to sort of work your way through this and say, okay, here's, I've got this, this is the information I have at this particular spot in the genome, and how do I bring it together? So you can go and look at those tools if you want to. They are uh, downloadable tools where you can, in theory, run them and train them. I have not heard anybody really outside of those groups uh, successfully installing and running those tools and trying to, <laughs> to do them, uh, mostly because they're, I think, so new and people are still finding their way to them. But I think these are, are the two best ones out there right now if you want to try to, to bring a bunch of data together uh, and you really want to push, push the envelope. Some of the, <coughs> the, the data from the Chrome HMM that they ran on the encodes, on a bunch of encode cell lines is available as a tracking. 
genome browser. Correct. That's, if, if you want to be able to like, see if you've got a SNP that overlaps those. Yep, they also have uh, attached uh, reference pages where they've got the pre-computed uh, segmentations for, for a few different sets. So because they're in code based, uh, they, the two richest sets are for the uh, sort of pure, I guess three richest sets are these tier one cells that were generated in the ENCODE project. So they're K562 cells and the, there's a lymphoblastoid cell line that was extensively used. And I think there's a, a, a Schriffitz healer or what the other third cell line is. There's one third, there's a third set. Uh, they do do a few of the other ones, but those three ones are where you really have, have rich data. Uh, very human uh, centric. So coming, I guess, for, for other species as we, we move along. Um, if you're interested, though, you can also read about them a little bit just to get a sense of where things are going to be in about three years' time because these things will eventually emerge into uh, tools where you'll say, give me a genome and now classify it into segments and give me a segment that is involved in, in you know, hair follicle cells or, or the like. Okay, so I mentioned that these were segmentation systems, subclasses. Um, you're trying to use data properties to subset the genome. Um, and then both of the systems don't really take into, take into account sort of training data where you'd say, okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of promoters and teach you to find promoters. So that's sort of a mach sort of classic machine learning style. Mostly what these tools do is they try to segment and classify the system into to groups. And then they look at their different groups and say, what are the characteristics of those groups? And do they have a high correlation with certain characteristics? So for instance, they'll say, class 23 uh, has these segments in the genome. And when I look, all my promoters that I know about fall into class 23. So I'm going to call class 23 my promoter promoter region. So the, at, the attachment of meaning to the classes usually occurs post, uh, post, class, post training of the methods. Um, they require specific data. Um, so you need different, uh, some of them are more flexible than others, but basically you have certain classes of data that they're tuned for and ready to take in. Um, they're particularly generated on ENCODE projects. Um, and it's still a um, work in progress until it becomes widely available outside ENCODE. So that's sort of the, the outer edge of the space, and it's what you, you may see in the next couple of years coming along. Okay. Now, one of the, the things that we're going to, to do in our exercises today um, is try to find more meaning from our, from our chip regions um, so that we can take a little bit more out of them. Um, and so one of the tools that we'll look in a lab session today is, is can we infer pathways and in networks and gene processes based on, on chip seek data? So the tool that we'll use when we get into that segment is called GREAT. Um, it's a, a package that was developed at Stanford in Gilbert Gerano's lab. And it essentially says, takes as input um, a, a bed file so that you, you give it the coordinate locations of your, your regions of interest. Um, and it then says, OK, based on the criteria that you use, the parameters that you select, it says, what are the genes that are proximal to those regions? And then based on the genes that are proximal, it goes and identifies the annotations of those genes, and then tries to say, what are the pathways and networks that are associated with those, those locations? Um, it is um, particularly, uh, particularly good for, for those people with, with um, epigenetic or, or transcription factor data that highlights certain uh, sort of relatively small subsets of the genome. It runs well, and it has um, an, as nicely incorporated an enormous number of, of data sets and data tools in its analysis. So once it's got the gene set that is there, it goes out and it, it sort of funnels through an awful lot of different data sources to give you a series of reports. So we'll do that as a lab exercise in a few minutes so that you have a chance to, to take a look at that and see, see how it, it works. Uh, anybody with chip data should be, is well served uh, to be aware of it and give it a shot. Um, I mentioned that it takes as input a, a bed file um, and then gives as output multiple enrich enrichment measures. So when we get there, um, this is just a couple of screenshots to give you a sense of the sorts of things that it's doing. Kind of fuzzy today. Um, so it's basically giving you a report on uh, where these are relative to uh, transcription starts and how many genes are found within the proximity of it. And then it goes on from there um, to give you the, the enrichment analysis results for the, for the network pieces. 
Okay, the other piece that we're going to try to do today, uh, which we'll do first, so I probably should have swap these in order, uh, is to look at transcription factor interactions. So we would like to uh, uh, understand how sets of transcription factors are acting together in a system. So we have in the human genome, we have 1,500 transcription factors. We have more than 1,500 look contexts in which we want to have expression. So the way the cell generates those different contexts is through, through interactive combinations of different transcription factors as well as modification of the proteins in, in certain ways. Um, so understanding the TFTF interactions allows us to take uh, what might be a large set of target regions um, and then to focus on a smaller subset of those regions that are sharing additional characteristics. So it's a way to start baking, taking a big set and breaking it down into some smaller sets where you can then look for meaning on the smaller sets that might be, might be deeper. Um, the, the opossum work that you did yesterday really looks at um, co-occurrence in when the anchored, anchored opossum analysis looks at co-occurrence. Um, but there's actually an increasing evidence that there can be spacing uh, rules that are much tighter than just that they're somewhat near each other. And so there have been observations now in several contexts where you actually see a, a physical relationship between the, where one site is and where another site is, uh, which is an indication that there's some sort of direct physical interaction between the proteins. And so the best tool that's out there right now, in my opinion, for looking at those types and discovering those types of direct physical interaction distances is called SPAMO. Um, and it's a tool within the meme suite. So you, you have been familiar with the meme suite uh, from yesterday's exercise. And so it's a relatively, um, relatively decent interface, although I had to, to work with them yesterday because it was broken on their motif handling piece, uh, which is now fixed. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Thank goodness they're in Australia, and so that we can get some extra hours in overnight. Um, so the, uh, what SPAMO allows you to do is look for precise spatial patterns between binding sites, and it gives you, uh, um, it gives you a nice report whereby when you run it, uh, what you see is you give it your primary factor. So you say, this is the factor that I, I'm primarily interested in. Um, and we'll, we'll use the same data sets that we used yesterday for, for studying uh, STAT1. Um, and then it gives you a report about what is the um, most uh, statistically significant relationship that it finds. Um, and it goes through a whole database of, of binding profiles. And the report that you get, get back essentially gives you uh, the two factors that it finds uh, a significant score up there in the upper right. And then it gives you a nice visual plot showing you where the co-occurrences are situated uh, physically distance. So it masks out, uh, in the middle, it masks out the binding site for the first factor, your primary factor. And then it plots uh, where you see um, the next factor site. Now, one of the things you'll, you'll notice, particularly with STAT1, is STAT1's a, a palindromic site. And so yesterday when you looked at it, you saw there was sort of a double peaked uh, characteristic in the, in the central mo plots. Um, that's just because you have uh, sort of one base pair off, depending on if you're looking at it, the forward strand or the reverse strand, uh, where the, the edges of the sites are located. Um, and so you occasionally see things that are, are right, essentially overlapping it on the reverse stream. So you have a chance to look at that on the system and to, to take a look at it and get a, a sense of how to interpret it. I just want to tell you a few things about what will be coming in the future and to give you sort of a closing thought on what we've, we've done and gotten out of the, the past uh, 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 day. So some of the things that will transition over the next few years, just so that you know where things are now and where things will come, is that the, the weight matrix models that we've been using here, so these, these sort of fixed matrix models, are, are still the dominant one. You see them in all the tools right now. Um, but with the richness of ChIP-seq data, all of a sudden we have much better ways of, of looking at transcription factor binding sites. And those models are going to gradually be replaced by, by one of two different classes. They're either going to be an energy model system, where we think about the binding of the factors in terms of their total energy, uh, or they will be replaced with, with HMM models, which we use for protein analysis right now, but not so much for transcription factor binding sites. And the reason is that as we get richer data sets, we're finding that there are, are variable spacing sometimes between half sites. We're finding that there's little edge characteristics, so that there's characteristics that may be related to either the bending of the DNA. Uh, and so you're getting these much richer characteristics of the binding sites. And these, these weight matrices can't capture those characteristics. And so right now the field is researching and working to come up with that next generation of tools. Uh, and so that transition will happen. 
Um, but it will, uh, the main tools will be PWM based probably for the next few years, uh, next three years as, as we see that transition, but it will come. Um, there will be more integration of the diverse data types. So I mentioned the Chrome H&M and the Segway uh, in the presentation. Those types of tools are being developed in massive numbers right now. And so there will be friendly tools that take into account uh, data sets uh, that will emerge over the next 18 to 24 months. And so you'll see, see a new generation of tools that deal with that. Uh, I mentioned yesterday the Phantom Project and the fact that we're going to see this, this uh, late later this year, we're going to see this release of this massive um, promoter activity data, uh, which is this sort of deep RNA-seq, and that it has this extra layer of enhancer functionality that's going to come into play. And so it's going to be it's another complementary data source to all the sorts of things that we, we've seen um, to date. And so it's going to have a pretty big impact. And uh, there's a large community of people that are, are focused on sort of the three-dimensional structure of the nucleus. And so how do we take into account uh, chromatin confirmation and the like in, in dealing with regulatory sequence analysis? And so that's a domain that's, that's growing very rapidly, and we're going to see an awful lot coming uh, in the next few years. Um, some of the big challenges ahead, we're going to have to understand how all these different transcription factors are working. So most of the data right now has been focused on a few hundred of them. We've got 1,500 in the human system. We've got all sorts of species that have not been treated yet. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, with the whole genome sequencing, there's a big interest right now in genetic variation in transcription factor binding sites. So there's going to be a lot of work trying to say how do we, we determine meaning for, for regulatory sequence changes as opposed to exon uh, sequence changes. There's the challenges of integration and the transition from one model to the next. Okay, so what are the big highlights? If you sort of are a little bit overwhelmed and you're trying to say, what, what did I really get out of this, this section? Um, you learned a bit about transcription factor binding profiles. So you should have a better idea what those things look like, how you, those tools, how those matrices are generated, that they're represented by an alignment of a bunch of sites, and that they are pretty good at predicting whether the protein will stick to a piece of DNA in vitro. Um, but we also recognize that they are constrained because those models do not take into account any information about chromatin, and so they have no idea what's accessible, and so you have to combine them with other approaches to get to uh, what's functional uh, in a given cell. You tried pattern discovery, so you were able to take sets of sequences, put them into meme, and recover motifs out of it. So if you have a chip seek data set, uh, or you, you know, in some cases, gene list, you can go to meme and you can discover a new pattern that's overrepresented within that. You have some sense of how that worked loosely in the presentation, but by and large, you know that it's, it's looking at enrichment. You uh, tried opossum and you look to see that if we have databases of known patterns, that we can measure their enrichment in either a set of genes with gene IDs or in a set of regions with sequences. And that allows you to take this set of genes and try to connect them up to potential regulatory partners. And then you went further and you looked at sort of how you might study relationships between transcription factors. So you looked to see if we could extend from, from looking at a set of genes and identify groups of transcription factors that can act together. And that in the final segment here, you look to see that you could use uh, ChIP-seq data for a set of genes uh, and infer and identify potential relationships, functional relationships, based on the grade analysis. So I thank you all for your, your time and your attention and your willingness to explore together. Uh, you asked great questions. Many of you brought nice resources to, to mind, and I appreciate your, your engaged interest. And I wish you very well for the rest of the day. I think you're going to have a great time with Quaid, Lincoln, and Gary. Okay. Thank you all.